Well, I talk about <clears throat> Kraft Erich's vision. And what makes life rich is when one has the good fortune to meet and work with a number of outstanding great minds of one time. One such person in my life was the great German-American space pioneer, Kraft Erike, whom I accompanied on a lecture tour through Germany in 1981, and who was on the advisory board of the Schiller Institute during the last years of his life. He was one of the great visionaries concerning man's identity as a space species, and he expressed that limitless optimism about the future of mankind, which only the great geniuses of humanity, of human history portray. Given his extraordinary prescience of the fundamental challenges in space science, which are only becoming obvious today, he deserves to be more recognized by several orders of magnitude. Kraft Erike was born in Berlin on March 24, 1917. When 12 years old, he saw the movie by Fritz Lang, Woman in the Moon, which together with the work of Hermann Obert was the inspiring experience that would shape his entire life. From that moment on, he would immerse himself in books about astronomy, flight mechanics, drive technology, and soon he started to design models of spacecraft. And <clears throat> he, then he became a prolific writer for technical journals. In 1938, he founded the Society for Space Research together with Franz <clears throat> Kaiser. He studied at the Technical University in Berlin, listened to Hans Geiger and Werner Heisenberg, and acquired a broad knowledge in natural sciences the evolution of life and the biosphere. From the standpoint of the evolution of life on the planet Earth, it was evident to him that the next natural phase of human evolution would be the settlement of the human species, first in nearby space and then eventually in the entire solar system and beyond. Interrupted by the convocation to the army during the war in 1940, he was ordered from the Eastern Front to Peenemünde because some of his patents concerning rocket designs found the attention of army services. There he worked together with Dr. Walter Thiel and Werner von Braun. He was tasked to investigate the application of the newly discovered nuclear fission te technology for rocket propulsion. After the war, he was one of the German scientists who moved per the initial Operation Paperclip to the US where he worked with rocket specialists, first in Fort Bliss in New Mexico, then in Huntsville, Alabama. There he became the chief of the Department for Gas Dynamics before moving to the private aviation firm Bell Aircraft. Later, he worked for General Dynamics. Kraft developed a number of applications for the Atlas rocket. His most revolutionary technical development was the Centaur rocket, an upper stage, the first hydrogen-fueled vehicle for which he earned the nickname Father of the Centaur Rocket. This energetic addition to any other rocket opened up the solar system to mankind, and it has carried everything from unmanned surveyor craft to the manned Apollo mission to Moon, from the Mariner missions to Mars to the Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft. In 1957, Kraft published the, quote, Anthropology of Astronautics, which point, pointed to the extraordinary significance of space research and travel for the sense of identity of the human species, and therefore as a concept to find solutions to seemingly unsolvable problems in the political and strategic situation. He wrote, the concept of space travel carries with it enormous impact because it challenges man on all practical, all fronts of his physical and spiritual existence. The idea of traveling to other celestial bodies reflects to the highest degree the independence and agility of the human mind. It lends ultimate dignity to man's technical and scientific endeavors. Above all, 
he touches on the philosophy of his very existence. As a result, the concept of space travel disregards national borders, refuses to recognize differences of historical or ethnological origin, and penetrates the fiber of the one sociological or political greed as fast as that of the next. As a technical concept, astronautics is all embracing and more revolutionary than anything conceived so far, including even atomic technology. As a scientific concept, it is bound to stimulate and rejuvenate practically all fields of astronomy to zoology. Its sociological and political implications are such that future generations may well describe as cautious even the boldest predictions of our time. Because of this, space travel holds perhaps the greatest general appeal for our complex and divided world. It seems to promise less immediate gain, material gains than atomic technology. Yet, or perhaps therefore, its spiritual appeal is extremely powerful, symbolizing as it does that man, after all, has not yet lost his capability of cutting the Gordian knot, of exploding old notions which, which retard his development and of overcoming seemingly invincible physical obstacles. If it can be done here, it can eventually also be done in other segments of our life today, where man seems to be hopelessly and perpetually deadlocked. A feeling of enthusiasm and genuine interest seems to prevail among all those who deal with spaceflight and astronautics, school children learning about it, congressmen allotting money for it, political leaders of the East and West praising their nation's contributions to its progress. And last but not least, scientists and engineers blazing the trail towards its eventual accomplishment. Well, while the present day realities like the Wolf event Amendment in the United States or recent accusations that China is about to take over the moon seem to contradict such an optimistic perspective. It is also a fact that if one leaves the space scientists and astronauts among themselves, that feeling of enthusiasm and genuine interest that Kraft Erika speaks about clearly prevails and gives a pretaste of what will be a natural cooperation of representatives of the human species of the future. Just think a couple of hundred, thousand, of, or millions years ahead, and that's what we should be thinking about. Do you really think that we will be still squabbling among each other like a bunch of snotty-nosed children fighting over their toys? This is why the lofty principles laid out by Kraft Erika are a useful reminder that humanity is the unique species capable of reason. And out of that follows the ability to again and again come up with solutions which are on a higher level than that on which the problems arose. So he stated beautifully in what he called the three fundamental laws of astronautics. First law, nobody and nothing under natural laws of the universe impose any limitation on man except man himself. Second law, not only the earth, but the entire solar system and as much of the universe as he can reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. Third law, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. He calls the first law a declaration of independence from uncritically accepted conditions, from a past and principally different pre-technological world clinging to humanity. And he explicitly cites the US Declaration of Independence, which represented the rejection of empire for the sake of the public, as a proof that such an axiomatic break with a flawed thinking is actually possible. The way Kraft situated the third law in that space operations have an anthropological character puts him in total cohesion with the tradition of the Platonic 
Humanist Tradition of Nikolaus of Kuhs, Johannes Kepler, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Vladimir Vernadsky. Namely, that the idea of the inner cohesion of the laws of the macrocosm and the microcosm and the increasing dominance of the noosphere over the biosphere. The fact that man is the only source of intelligent life known to us so far, Kraft says, gives him, quote, the right to expand, to develop, and to enrich the foundations of his existence to the limits of his capability. And it is the continued problem solving of living elsewhere in the solar system or even in interstellar space that gives spaceflight its ultimate anthropological meaning. While it is totally normal today to talk about lunar industrialization, he was one of the most original and far-sighted pioneers in this endeavor. In the development of the moon, he saw the first step of the extraterrestrialization of mankind, which will change and develop mankind to a more advanced stage. He describes how on Earth the biosphere came first, and then through evolution, mankind developed. On the moon, it will be reversed. Man will arrive first, and only then the conditions are created for life to exist there. This was beautifully demonstrated by China's Chang'e 4 lunar lander mission, which got the first plant to ever germinate and sprout on another world, inaugurating a new era for life in space. Kraft regarded the moon as the seventh continent of Earth, and in the 1970s, he elaborated a detailed study for the industrialization of the moon in five phases. In the first phase, goods are exclusively transported from Earth to the moon. In the third phase, goods retrieved back to the Earth. And in the fifth, life and production on the moon are not self-sufficient, uh, but a city called Selenopolis, which becomes the capital of the new moon civilization and becomes the support basis for new colonies in the solar system. This picture shows the energy supply for the city coming from a tokamak fusion reactor. The design of the city is expandable, so it can grow with the increase of the population and its activities. The canopies go from 500 meters up to several kilometers. There you see actually uh, children skating on ice. So Kraft anticipated uh, that the different climates on Earth will be recreated. Cold winters, warm agricultural areas, dry or subtropical climates. In the first phase of industrialization, the energy source would be high the high temperature reactor, followed by thermonuclear fusion. He proposed to use the first generation deuterium tritium fusion reactors to breed the rare isotope helium-3 in order to realize the technologically more challenging deuterium-helium fusion, one that could reach a higher energy efficiency. He could not yet know that on the moon there are significant amounts of helium-3 and that Chinese space scientists are planning to import this back to the Earth in order to fuel fusion reactors here. After Kraft Erika had died on December 11th, 1984, the Los Angeles Times wrote about him that he had fascinated many audiences when he was featured in TV or radio programs talking about building swimming pools on the moon despite the low gravity uh, or about in interstellar spaceships that could make our galaxy the backyard of mankind. For Kraft, the goal was not a village on the moon, nor even a city on Mars. Rather, he thought in terms of the long-range long range aspect of interstellar exploration of the universe. In an unpublished book, he considers relativistic interstellar flight investigating Einstein's special and general relativity. Given the fact that recently the proof was found that Einstein's assumptions about gravitational waves are correct and his theory that in the center of every galaxy there are black holes, this means it is proven that we are living in a relativistic universe. What that will mean for the possibility of interstellar space travel and possibly even beyond 
is mind-boggling. But it is exactly this kind of bold thinking in hypothesis, as outlandish and bold as it may appear to be at the time, which is characteristic of the human species and which separates us from all other living creatures known so far. Once again, Kraft's far ahead and unblocked thinking should be an inspiration. Naturally, from this standpoint of limitless perfectibility of human creativity in an anti-entropically developing universe, Kraft recognized the terrible implication of the emerging zero cross ideology as it appeared in the beginning of the 1970s with the Club of Rome and the resulting green ecology movement. He recognized the intellectual fraud of Meadows and Forrester, who in their book Limits to Cross had completely left out the role of science and technology in the definition of what a resource is, and pointed to the qualitative difference between propagation and growth, a differentiation which has completely disappeared for the green movement today. Kraft stated, for them, the environment, the environment of life of man is a closed system, limited to earth. Not for me. The field of activity of man is today as little a closed sphere as it was a flat disk earlier. The report Global 2000 is a warmed up version of the same nonsense, contains obvious misinformation and misjudges as its notorious predecessor, the human ability for limitless growth. Growth is, in contrast to mere propagation, an increase in knowledge, wisdom, and capacity to grow in a new way. For Kraft Erike, the idea of space travel was the most logical and lofty consequence of the ideal of the Renaissance, which put man in the context and in an active context with the cosmos, building on the most noble traditions of the ancient classics. He showed the way how by lifting the eyes to the star and by working to make them the home of humanity, man can realize both his innate dignity and the age of reason. Last slide, please. Yeah. In the age, uh, in the year following Kraft Erich's death, the Schiller Institute <coughs> held a memorial in his honor. It would be wonderful if the international space community would do it again.